our glorious Father, we thank you so very, very much for your Son, Jesus. We thank you so very much for the presence of your Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Lord, for life that we can see yet another day. The privilege of standing in your presence to give you glory, to give you honor, to worship and to magnify you as the true, the living and the only God. We bless your holy name, Father. We bless you, wonderful Jesus. We ask you, Lord, that you would have the preeminence. Have the preeminence in everything we say, in everything we do, Lord, so that you would be the one that would be glorified. And we ask it in Jesus' name and with the saints of God say, Amen. God bless you richly. You may be seated. Well, a glorious, wonderful good morning to everyone present here this morning. It's so good to be home. Did you miss us? Well, we missed you all terribly. Though, last Sunday, just around this time, I was about to preach as usual. I was ministering in a little, what they call a, um, what do you call the name of the church again? A, no, no, no. Um, it was in Pennsylvania, but a storefront church. You know, it's a little church, just like a storefront, few people, but God was so present in that place. So I'm here this morning to say we missed you very, very much, and to introduce our speaker, our brother Glenroy, to you. So let's put our hands together and welcome him. Oh, oh, <laughs> thank you, Brother Glenroy. How about those of you who are here with us for the very first time on a Sunday morning? You know, sometimes it slips you when you slip out and slip back in. For the first time on a Sunday morning, we always like to meet our visitors with us. So why don't you stand so that we can extend a hand of welcome to you? We're always glad, yes, we have any in the balcony. Yes, one in the balcony. Under the balcony, we have two. And up front here, we have about five. God bless you richly, and thank you for visiting with us. Now we can put our hands together and welcome our brother. And good morning. Yes, it's... it's Good to have the man of God back in the house. Yes. That's the anointing, that's the covering that God has placed here. Yes. Yeah. We thank God for him. Amen? Yes. How many of us are glad to be here today? Yes. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. This morning... The Lord is going to speak to us from his word once again. I pray that our hearts and our spirits would be receptive to what the Spirit of God is saying to us as a people, individually, and as a church, corporately. I repeat that. I ask and I pray that your hearts be receptive to what the Spirit of God is saying to you and to me individually and as a church collectively. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you for your love towards us. We thank you, Lord, for choosing us to be your own Lord, a people call unto your name. We know, Lord, that you know what we desire and where we are. And I pray, Holy Lord, that every heart here will be receptive to your voice. Cause us to realize 
the voice of the Spirit of God speaking unto the church in these last days. And that we, O oh Lord, will discover your presence in our life on a daily basis so that we can have the fullness of our salvation and the fullness of the presence of God and your purpose worked out in our lives. I pray only, Lord, that which your people need to hear should be spoken, O oh God, through this message. And I thank you for the anointing, O oh God, upon my life, Lord, to do your will. Let your will and let your purpose be accomplished in this service this night, this day. And we thank you, Lord Jesus. Turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 28. Genesis chapter 28. I will not read the full account uh, because of time. The message is centered around one verse, and that is verse 16. Genesis chapter 28. Yes, the first book of the Bible, if anyone. But we would begin to read I want to go back too far. Let's begin to read from verse 10. And Jacob went out from Bathsheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night, because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. I'm reading from the King James Version. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it unto thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with thee, and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest, and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee. Verse 16, it's our text. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. As I said before, the 16th verse will be the text from which we are going to speak or develop the message that God has sent for us today. The purpose of today's message is to help us to discern our true spiritual condition so that the decision we make in following God or not The decision we make in following God or not will be made with a clear understanding and not in ignorance, no deception. When the Spirit of God places this statement in my heart, I say, Lord, that is heavy. But the genesis of this message, saints of God today, is that the heart of the Lord is bleeding because his people do not know him. And because we do not know God in personal experience, because we do not know him, we, his people, grope about in the darkness of this world and being assailed on every side with evil, and knew not what to do. And the heart of God is beating with a yearning for his people to understand and know him. The topic of the message today is discerning God. 
I have ministered a similar message on knowing God, but God has a way of taking particular perspectives that he wishes to highlight and bring to us. It is like fortifying your meal with a little more vitamins or putting in a little more of a particular food group that your body needs to assimilate that you will grow balanced. So those of us who may hear certain things that are familiar, because we hear a lot of preaching, understand that God is speaking to us in a particular context. And it is so wonderful, really, really wonderful. And my heart rejoices and I bless God that we labor in preparing the word to bring to God's people. And you walk into the sanctuary, God confirms it in your spirit. Because sometimes when we labor, we wonder if we are hearing from God. Oh yes, we do. Not that we are hearing, but we there's so much of ourself in things that we wrestle with God like Jacob, the same Jacob we're reading about. But I am blessed today, and I, I, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind, absolutely none. And particularly when we have sung the last song that we sang, God is speaking to us today, to you and to me. If we had to take a poll among all persons who are not atheists, religious folks, we are polling, we would be surprised to find out the extent to which people do not know God. We will be surprised to know the extent to which people do not know God. We know of God. We know about God. We hear about God. We say we believe it, but we do not know him. To make this point, there are, how many of us know President Barack Obama? I, I don't want to go anything in local, so let me go foreign, okay? <laughs> how many of us know the President of the United States? Okay, we know of him. So if you hear the name, you say, oh, he's the President of the United States. How many of us really know, know him? Of course, we will not know him like his wife will. I would be able to speak of him as she did at the convention, right? But we know of him. But we don't know him. It is not an exact comparison, and I'm not attempting to do so. But it is so it is with us and God. We know of God. We can speak about it. We, yes, we know. But... When we are in our situation, when we are in our circumstance, when the trials surround us, we wonder. Now, it doesn't mean that we are bad. It doesn't mean that we are failing. No. It means that God wants us to know assuredly that's why he's sending his word. It is not a condemnation because you will see you will see in the scriptures, if you st study the word, that time and time again, men of God who walked with him question God and ask him because he is God. He was from the beginning of all things and he knows all things. We cannot comprehend him with our imagination. We cannot, we cannot wrap our minds around him. He's bigger than that. So there are always dimensions of him and experiences that we have not yet come into and things which we and the things we are not sure of. So we would always have questions. But as we walk with him, and as we set our hearts on knowing him and on seeking him, we will find him. And as the song say, we are not seeking his hand. We know that there are things that we need. But we also know and should know that with him he is everything. Has everything. It is a confidence that we need, saints of God, because then why pursue God alone? Then it will be necessary to pursue God and something else or someone else. It is a confidence that those who come to Him as the Word of God say must believe that He is God and that He is the rewarder of they who diligently seek Him. 
It is that confidence that the Holy Spirit wants to speak to us today so that we would know that this is the way. Walk ye in it. For make no mistake, saints of God, the times that are upon us are times that are going to try our souls. The, let me repeat that. Don't sit down. I know we came out of beautiful worship. Don't look at me so sanctified. We are going to be tried in the days in which we are living. For we are living in the last days according to the word of God. And the faith of many around us will fail. God does not want us to fail. He is accomplishing his purpose. He has set the time in which he is going to send his son back to gather his saints together. And he just wants us to endure and trust him. He is the all-sufficient God. Amen? Amen? That's not a Christian cliche. It is we must know that God is my all-sufficient God. And the way we do these things is that we believe what is said of God. And we settle it in our hearts that he is. We don't question it. I don't want to get ahead of a message. So you'll be surprised to know how many people do not know God. Even more surprising it will be if we poll Christians. Many Christians will readily confess that they do not know God in personal experience. They are not consciously aware of the presence of God. There is no intimate acquaintance with God. God is not real, real in their lives. This is not, again, I, I, I hasten to add, to bring a condemnation. It's to describe a state and for you to understand that if you are in the state, the purpose of the word is to extricate you out of it so that you would have that confidence towards God because the word of God say the people that know their God will be strong. The people that know their God will be strong and will do great exploits. Thank you, Lord. You say, Brother Glenroy, but I ain't seen no great exploits. The people who know their God will be strong and will do great exploits. You know why? God said so. Many Christians believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. They love and worship the Lord. They read the word of God. They pray and attend church. And like Philip, they still do not know the Father, although they have been long with Jesus. How can this be, one may ask? How can it be, Brother Glenroy? Way back in Deuteronomy, Moses said in Deuteronomy 4, chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 29. But if thou from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him. If thou wilt seek him with all thy heart and all thy soul. Way down in Deuter Deuteronomy, Moses, when he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, out of the bondage in Egypt, told them that when you would have transgressed and you would have been um, banished to other lands, if you will return from where you are, if you, if you will return from your state and you will seek him, you will find him, but only if you do so with all your heart. Jeremiah re repeated Moses' admonition in Jeremiah 29, 12 and 14. He said, then shall you call upon me and you shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you and you shall seek me and find me when you shall have searched for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, verse 14, saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity. Now I know we are not captive, per se, but we are in situations that we would like them to be broken. We would like them to be dealt with. We are in situations that we, 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 we would like to be extricated. We are living in situations, many of us, that are not convenient and things are difficult and we cannot understand and we, are, and, and we, 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 are, we want answers. But God is saying that you will find me if you will seek with me, 
Seek me with all your heart. So I've quoted Moses and I've quoted Jeremiah. The Lord Jesus himself, when he was upon the earth, quoted the prophet Isaiah in making the statement when he spoke in Mark 7, verse 6. Well had Isaiah prophesied of you, as it is written, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their hearts is far from me. How be it in vain do they worship me? The three quotations I've made here and the three references of Scripture proves quite, prove quite clearly how we can do all things Christian and still not know God. So we have discovered today the very first reason why we will not know or be able to discern God in our lives and our situation. And clearly the reason is what was said over and over. With all our hearts and with all our souls speak of sincerity. And many times if we are not sincere in our approach to God, we will not find God. And if we are not sincere in our approach to God, we will not discern God in what is happening. So we will grope about in the dark. We will go from church to church, from prophet to prophet, from one sister or brother to another sister or brother, because we want somebody to tell us why. Because we are not hearing from God. Do you understand the condition I'm talking about? But God wants us to know him. So the first reason for our lack of personal experience with God that I want to discuss today, there are many, I'm going to discuss three, is our lack of sincerity as Christians. Our lack of sincerity of the people of God. Now you will want to know, well, Brother Glenroy, but I am seeking him with all my heart. We need to be careful, lest our hearts deceive us. We need to be careful. We need to let God be true and all man and every man a liar. We will find him. Everyone say, we will find him. Find him. Let's repeat that. We will find him. Because that's his promise. That is his promise to us. And God does not lie. He's not a man to lie. So that if we are not sincere in our efforts, as my wife always reminds me, if we are not consistent with our efforts, and sincerity promotes consistency. When we are sincere, we are consistent. We are not double-minded in any way. Our hearts are fixed. Our minds are made up. As this message comes to us, we examine ourselves. We examine nobody else. Are we in that state? I said that the purpose is to examine know our spiritual condition so that we will, the decision we make in continuing with God from here will be a decision that you make deliberately, as it is said, in your own deliberate judgment. And not that you thought, not that you, are, you did it in ignorance, or not that you have been deceived. For the word of God is going to expose the lies of the enemy today. That he would have spoken into your minds every time. And every time you have to utter the words, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And I'm in relation to God. I didn't say you would know everything. Every time you have to say, but I don't know. But you know God who knows everything. If we can say so and at the same time, attach to it. But my hope and trust is in God. With the confidence, that's okay. But we do so almost forlorn, almost forsaken, almost in a bit of despair. And I want to bring balance to what I'm saying this morning. I'm not saying that the trying of, of faith at times cannot 
make us exasperated. I'm not talking about occasional moments of exasperation. I'm talking about your personal knowledge of God in your life first. Because you need to be grounded with that. The Lord showed that to me. If you are grounded with that, nothing will shake you. Whether you have or whether you do not have, it does not matter. You are grounded. There is need for us to be grounded. We will not, as they say in American politics, note well I'm not doing anything about local politics. As they say in American politics, you're not flip-flopping. You know, even in the world, having used that analogy, even in the world, it is unacceptable for sinful, wicked man to accept people flip-flopping. Must God accept us flip-flopping? You know, God, when he was talking to the children of Israel through the prophet, say you come and you offer the torn and the lame and the weak and the sick on my altar, Say, go and offer it to your priest and see if you accept it. We bring what we feel to God. It's, it's another message. So, please understand the context of the message. So, the first problem we want to discuss and we want to deal with in our lives today as the Holy Spirit reveals it is that of our sincere walk with God and our consistency that we want to seek Him with our whole heart. And Jesus Christ asked the young man, what is the first, what is the, um, what is the, what is the most, the, the greatest commandment, thank you, Pastor, was the greatest commandment. He said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And Jesus Christ said, thou hast well said, and the second is like unto it. So, God wants to discover himself to us. He wants us to find him as our loving Father. But He wants us to be sincere. And as I meditated and pondered on why sincere, why, 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 why I have to do it with my whole heart, there is something in us called a latent unbelief. Like latent heat. Let me explain it. If the sun was very, very hot in your living room or in your bedroom, in your house, although the sun would have set and have gone down, no more sun shining, 7 o'clock, the house is still hot. That's what you call latent heat. Although God would have brought us into his kingdom, Although God is working to change us, if we do not stay with it, that latent unbelief that we had, because he gave us a measure of faith to believe, but nothing needs to grow more than our faith. And if that is not growing, what is going to kick in is the residue or the latent unbelief that will make us begin to doubt. That is why, as I've always ministered, the answer, for, uh, the answer Jesus gave to all of his disciples, and us included, follow me. Where you are, you will not know. Where you are, you will not find out. But as you follow me, you would realize. So therein is the answer for most of the things that perplex us. Just continue to follow him. Just continue through the, uh, through the pain. Just continue through the disappointment. Just continue through the hardship. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. Just continue. The devil wants you to give up and tell you no, something wrong. If you were the child of God, every, that wouldn't have been happening. Look how you're praying. You see why it is important to know? Yes, it is important to know. It is important for me. When I bend my knees, I know I pray to God. Hold on, I can't pray and answer at the same time. My, my job is to pray. His job is to do what? Right, so I'm concentrating on his job or mine. 
Right, so I have prayed. You know, I like what Jesus said to Peter. He said, Peter, Peter, Satan desires to have you, that he would sift you like wheat. But I, hallelujah, hallelujah. And that was not said for Peter's sake. I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. Amen? Amen. We know Jesus Christ has prayed for us. He has prayed the Father, Lord. He didn't ask that you take them out of the world. But he asked that you would keep them. We need to be kept. And he understands this, so he's sending his word to ground us so that we will be kept from the evil one. We will be kept. Amen? Amen. However, insincerity alone does not fully explain this problem to many genuine Christians. Many, many Christians are genuine in their intent, in their, in their desires. They genuinely love the Lord. They want to follow the Lord. And it's not that they are insincere. So let us look at a second reason or a second possibility. There are many who will say that they do not have a conscious experience of the presence of God in their lives. But who are sure that they love God and have no other gods and possess genuine sentiments of affection towards the things of God? Now let me hasten to add here. I am not talking about dry spells. No wilderness experience, no valleys in your life. You know, according to the song, life is easy when you're up on the mountain. <laughs> so they, I'm not talking about dry spells. I'm not talking about you... If you are going through a period where, Lord, what is happening to me spiritually, I don't know. I'm not talking about because you're still calling out on God. I'm talking about the faith of the child of God. Who in the circumstances of life, who when we look at the vicissitudes of life, the things that are happening around us, we are not sure. And that there is a lot of talk between different religions and different groups. And, 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 and everybody seems to be saying the right thing or the same thing. So there, we, there seems to be no difference. And, 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 and they do not know God. That is what I'm talking about. They do not know God. I'm not talking about the dry spells that we go through. And some dry spells are good. You, oh, you, oh, you take it from me. When you're in some dry spells, that's right where God wants you. He's going to humble you. That pride out of you is going to come. Yeah. Or when you continue to make mistakes over and over and you wonder what you want to give up and you want to take 40 sabbatical, God have you right there. You would realize that you are a sinner and you need me. Yes. Without me, you cannot make it. And then you fall on your face like Peter. Oh, depart from me, O oh God, from a sinful man. Lord, help me. Hi. Because you would have tried in your own flesh. I don't want to go off the message. So let me hasten to, 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 to add that I'm not talking about that. The times and trials and tribulations that are testing our souls, I'm not talking about that. For we must all go through much tribulation and period when the heavens of our head seem as brass and as Elijah, we cry out, enough, Lord, now take my life. So imagine... Now, this is Elijah. This is Elijah, the great prophet of God who appeared on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus, who did not taste of death, was translated. When he was told by, what was the lady? Um, Jezebel, because he killed 400 of a false prophet. She said, the Lord do so and more to me if by tomorrow your head, I don't have your head. Elijah run and go on and sit down under a juniper tree. Listen, how many of us would have liked to be like Elijah? I have both hands up. Come on, how much you putting up? Come on. But when the testing came, when that decree from Jezebel came, Elijah run, the same one who defended God, the God of heaven, in front of 400 prophets and slay them. He said, enough, Lord. Take my life. I, I want it dead. So there are times that the, 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 the soul of man will feel. But he said, enough, Lord. He knew God. Just as he felt discouraged. Felt fearful. 
So what I'm saying, if you at times, and I at times, find ourselves in that situation, we're in good company. Huh? We're in Elijah's company, not so? How many of us would like to be in Elijah's company? I would like. Now, neither by conscious awareness of the presence of God and intimate acquaintance with God, I am, I, I am in any way referring to mountaintop or goose pimples experience. I'm not saying that because you are not having mountaintop experience or you're not having goose pimples or because in the worship probably you didn't uh, experience God the way that you... I'm not referring to that. I'm referring to something more basic. Something, how we cannot discern God. How, we, how God is in this situation, but we cannot see it. How God wants to, how God is doing a work in our life and playing a part in it, but we cannot discern him. So that as a result, we, if we are not grounded with knowing God, we are tended to move away from God because of the, situ because of the situations. So I'm not referring to that, and I want to put balance to it. So if we are in situations where, we are, where things are difficult for us, or we feel that we miss God, or we feel weary, or we feel tired, listen, many people grow weary, many people grow tired. That's a fact. Jesus called his disciples, he said, come away, come away, come away and rest for a while. Sometimes we need to take a break for a while. Not, not, not a break from God, break from some of the routines. Right? Because there, there, there are things pertaining to the kingdom of God that we, we get ourselves involved in. There are some Bible conferences and so on that we... Um, I didn't say go, do don't kind of Bible study, yeah? But there are some Bible conferences and so on and, 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 and other events and, and, and all kinds of events that we busy ourselves and supporting and we move away. We get so busy and weary, we cannot worship the Lord as we ought to. We have no quiet moment. We can't come and sit down. Pull up your pants and say, Father... Oh, Lord, just show me today exactly what I would do. And you talk to him as, 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 as a man talk to a friend because your father, he has put his spirit in you. He has paid a price for you. I ministered this here last Friday when I ministered, uh, and, 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 and it bears repeating. We must understand that God is the one who, sent, who redeemed man. God created us for his purpose, for his pleasure, and because of sin, we were wrenched loose from the presence of God. Because of sin, he could not have his fellowship. So, but God has a purpose. God is a God of purpose. He's a God of plan. He created us for that purpose. But alas, because of sin, he could have no relationship with us. And we cannot fulfill a purpose for which God, for which God created us. That was the situation. But what he did... God remedied the situation all by himself. It was God's desire to have a relationship with man that caused him to take his son, his only begotten son, and let him pay the price so that you and I can be reconciled in him. That it is God's doing. What else would prove the extent to which God wants us to know him? It's he who sent Christ to the cross, not for Jesus Christ's sake, but for my sake. Jesus Christ didn't die because he did anything wrong. He died because his father desired that you be reconciled with him and that the purpose for which he has created you would be realized, that you will be able to live your life in his presence, that you were able to draw your life from his smile, that your strength and his guidance and his wisdom will be your counsel and your comforter, not that you will grow up to find him. He desires that of us. It is he, that's what Paul said, it is he who worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It is he. Hallelujah. How can you stand and not praise him? How can you stand and not glorify his wonderful name? How could you stand and not say he's an awesome, wonderful God? Because Jesus made it plain. You did not choose me. I chose you. I chose you. It's I who want you. So, saint of God, knowing or discerning God is not a far-fetched thing and is not something for Pastor Banfield or something for the preachers and them. No, no, no. This is for the saints of God. 
Because he, and God has no favorites. God has no favorite. God is no respect of person. God said the heavens are my, the, 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 the heaven of heavens are my throne and the earth is my footstool. But to this man will I look. He that is of a humble and a contrite heart or spirit. And he trembleth at my word. All we need to do is have that respect unto God. Unto the word of God. That we will have that fear for God. That we will not live our lives in spite of God. But we will live our lives in holy reverence to him. And he will show up big in our lives. In our situation. And people will want to know what you do. No, I did nothing. He may not send a trunk load full of money for you to pay all your bills. Which again, when I go in ahead of the message, may not send it like that. This is what most of us would like. And if that happens, oh God, God is good. He is good. Somebody pass in and steal the trunk load of money. Anyway, I don't want to go there. So I told you I'm not referring to dry spells and to, and to, and to moments when we are down and we are tested and we, and we feel empty. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about mountaintop experiences. I'm referring to that persuasion of the soul that says like Job, I know my Redeemer lives. It's a persuasion of the soul. I know that my Redeemer lived, Job 19, 25, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. I know. To have time to go into Job's condition. And though after my skin worms destroy my body, yet in my face I will see him. Can we say that? Or do the enemy... Bombard our, does the enemy bombard our minds with the situation and cause us to be fearful, cause us to be uncertain, cause us to, to, to want to change course because it ain't looking like God. I want to hasten to say, saints of God, that as we pursue God in our personal lives, as we settle it in our hearts to follow God, remember this. That he has said to us, his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And so vastly different are his thoughts from us. And so vastly different are his ways from us. That he did not leave us guessing. He said, you see how far the heavens are from the earth? Come on, preach with me, you know it. Amen. Say, so far are my ways from your ways. And so far are my thoughts from your thoughts. In other words, if I put it my way and I paraphrase it, so wrong could you be about me. So wrong could you be about me in that situation. So wrong could you be. And that's like a word of caution so that the enemy, we will be able, you know, and that's why the word of God says so. That we must put on the whole armor of God. So we'll deflect, deflect these fiery darts of the devil. He comes at us and our minds are open season and he bombards us and we have nothing in us to deflect or withstand the darts that he throws at us all the time. So it is that confidence, that persuasion of soul like Jesus a persuasion of a soul like Job. Because remember from our text, and I highlighted it, Jacob discovered something. Jacob thought that he was in a wilderness all by himself. We read the text. Jacob thought, well, listen, I will just bed down here for the night. Jacob, well, it was a good thing to bed down. It's a good thing to, well, I had to sleep. I can't continue. So it's a good thing to come to church. So I will just continue coming to church. So I, Jacob thought he will do a good thing. Until he had an awakening. And he said, wait a boy. 
God, yeah, I, 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 I didn't know that. I, I, I didn't know that. So you and I, you think that you will mosey on in the church. You say, I'm not getting involved in anything. Not me, I just go in the church and I come in. I go in the church and I, I'm not getting involved in anything. But God is in it. Now, if you know that, you will come and you'll want to volunteer to do A, B, C. Nobody could, <laughs> no, no, nobody could have any place but you. You want all the positions. Why? Because you now discover God is in it. So, the point the message makes is that God is here. Not only in church. Not only among us. God is in our lives. The word of God said, I will give you a sign, Isaiah prophesied. And it was again repeated in the book of, in, 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 in the gospels of the birth of Jesus. I will give you a sign. This sign is a virgin, a virgin, a virgin, a virgin, a virgin. A virgin will make a child. A virgin will make a child. And he will be Emmanuel. He will be God with us. That was something that the angels saw and they celebrated. We don't see it. He is here with us. Yes. He is there in the situation that attends us. He is there waiting on you to draw from him. He is there. He knows your pain. He sees what has befallen you. He understands the difficulty that you're going through. And he realizes what the enemy has stolen. Wittingly, unwittingly, with or without your, your consent. You may have cooperated, but he understands. But he wants you to watch him turn all things around. Watch him make all things new. Watch him be God in your life. For he is creator. <laughs> He wants to do that for us. Sometimes we grope in that something might, might be. And the Lord is waiting for us to realize that that don't have to be for me to be with you. That don't have to be. He's trying to teach us object lessons. He's trying to make us strong. He's our father. Our pastor, minister here. What I would call a landmark message. So the eagle, so the Lord. The, the, the eagle loves this young you want to know how the, evil, how the eagle loves a young? You go and try to take a young out of eagle nest. You, you go, go with your fast self. You're a hunter. Go. <laughs> the eagle loves its young. But there comes a time where he takes his wing, put it under the young one, and way up on the cliff, he throws him out of the nest. Now oh, you and I will find that he's a bad eagle. No, oh, no, no. He knows that there's a this eagle have to fly. If he doesn't fly, he's going to be eaten. If you and I don't know our God, we are going to be deceived. We will fall. So we go through things and we don't know how we're making it. But God is keeping us. His grace is sufficient for us. He is sustaining us. He is our God in all season. And he is able to do it for us. And sometimes we come through. We don't know how we come through. And the foolish devil comes to my mind and tells you, you're lucky. <laughs> and we buy into that. We buy into that. When somebody gives their testimony, because of their faith in God, we listen to it with indifference. We ain't glad for the person. We, we just wish it could be me too. And we ain't moving no faith. We ain't knowing no God. Do you understand what I'm saying? But if we know God, or when we see God and find him. When the weight of his glory brings the bear in our situation. It is no secret, an old time song. What God can do. What he has done for others. He would do for you. God doesn't change. We know it. And he may not do it just as he did it for, for, for the other person. Just keep our eyes on him. Keep our eyes on the prize. Amen? Amen. You're learning anything from this message? Yes. Okay. I 
am speaking of the conviction of Paul that says I am crucified with Christ. If you read the book of Galatians, particularly chapters 1 and 2, 1, 2, and 3, to me it is like a very stirring letter with, with endless passion that he wrote to the Galatians. Why? Somebody tell them, except they keep the Sabbath and they do other things, they can't be saved. That is after Paul and preach, full of the Holy Ghost, blessed, and they leave, set up the church. Somebody come in the church with another doctrine. If you read that, you will hear the heart of Paul. He said, listen, man. He even put himself in it. So passionate, so convinced was Paul. He said, if I preach another gospel. You want me to preach something else? Can't. There's nothing else. If I come to you and I preach anything other than what I first ministered to you, let me be a curse. So convinced he was. And he went on. You, you should read it. I always think it's one of the most stirring, beautiful commentary that someone could have written to a church. He said, oh foolish Galatians, who have bewitched you? You have been bewitched, you have been deceived. In Trinidad, what we will say, somebody make your mom up in mama pool, pastor. I can't remember the word, right? But no, and it's so some of our Christians are behaving as though we have been bewitched, as though Jesus Christ is not Lord of all, as though somebody higher than Jesus Christ, as though somebody has the final say. God no longer is Alpha and Omega. Well, maybe God. Well, I ain't so sure. And we say it with such conviction. Our hearts bleed to wonder, aren't we bewitched or deceived into thinking that God is not able and he will not able? Even Jesus told her, he say, and will not God avenge those who call on him, though he bear with you long, just because you have to bear a little long. In, in, in the bearing, as we have always been taught by pastor, God is working. No, we don't see it. Come now, we are truly like little children. Oh, no, 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 like my little grand, uh, granddaughter. Well, cry, cry, cry until you get the bottle. But she has a mother... When she cries, says, sweetie, she'll cry, 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 no sweets. <laughs> I say, oh God, give her one. Uh, <laughs> you don't spoil a child. <laughs> you know how grandparents are. Oh God, your pocket full of sweets. And every time you kiss them, you won't give them one. <laughs> mother, mother say, no, 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 no sweet. She had enough. <laughs> That's what God knows. Do you think my daughter doesn't like her, uh, 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 her daughter? We think I as grandpa love her more than my... my me be nothing? <laughs> Listen, uh, hold on. You, you guys laugh at this. You guys laugh at this. But a lot of us sometimes, we like to sit down and look at other people's situation. And we all like to be open more, more blah, 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 and making comment about people. Let me tell you something. You ain't bear nothing. You ain't birth nothing. So it could be a business. It could be an occupation. It could be, it could be a church. You always find that the pastor should do that. And why you do that? Were you birth when you were? Where were you when he was birthing it? Oh, but you always have an opinion. And you're releasing your opinion through the congregation. What you birth? And this is how we are. This is how we are. We always have. We find. We just reach. <laughs> pastor would tell you. Well, many times when we were at South Key, huh, you come and you see Sanctuary looking nice carpet. When we were at South Key and he laying hand on people, he healed going down in a hole. And he asked him, Lord, how long? <laughs> when he get in his office, rat, how long? All you see is, but he ain't bound to do that. Uh, no, I'm going off my message, I'm sorry. I'm not... <laughs> but, but we do not birth anything. But we always quick to open them all. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear. Slow to speak. Anyway, I'm not going there. Okay. I am referring to the meter reading in the faculty of a spiritual cognition. I, I, I wanted you to say, hmm. I want to wake you up, those who would have gone to sleep. Yeah, that, I, I, I'll break it down. Don't worry, I'll break it down. I, I, I'll explain it. I'm not using big words to look good. What to look anointing? No, 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 no. That's not what I'm doing. 
I want you to know. I'm talking about how is it reading in, your, in the meter when you test how much you know God. How, how much you read on a scale from 1 to 10? 1, 0.5. <laughs> you understand? That's what I'm saying. Your spiritual cognition, cognition is just to know. Your cognitive ability is to know. You, you, you know, as we say, and pastor says many times. Do you know that 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 you know Anybody helping me? That you know. Do you know? That's what we are trying to test. How many times would you say, I know, I will. well, I know you know, boy, and we don't write it. One word. But we must know. We must be able to discern God. We must not be taken by surprise because of the machinations of the enemy. And God is in this place, but we don't know it. We did not know it. And the church will preach, you missed God. Because he's there. And God, but hold on. God didn't leave him in ignorance. If you read the beginning of the chapter, is his obedience in listening to his father and his mother. Do not take a woman from among the Canaanites. Go down by your brethren and take a wife. And in obedience, if you read it, that is the obedience. And because he was obedient, God showed himself to the boy. Because he was following the instruction of your parents. Children, today or tomorrow, your parents speak to you. And you feel that you're a man. But listen, God knows. And you are only thwarting your blessing by not listening to the anointing that is in your life. And here's something that we need to continue to pray for concerning our children. That is what, if you read the story, this is what all of this is about, you know. He was going to pick a wife. Not from Canaan. And if you read before, you will see that Esau didn't like that. And Esau went and take about two wives from the Canaanite. Just because. <laughs> but of course, Esau was vexed. You know he tricked Esau to the boat, right? And so on. So the father blessed Jacob. So, so now Jacob is blessed by them and send them to get a wife. He said, I go take two of these. <laughs> read it. That is what it was. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, so what I'm saying, it is at the point of obedience that God will show you at the point of your obedience and my obedience. God is going to show you that, listen, I am in this situation. You don't have to fight this battle. The battle is mine. I will fight it. He will show you at the point of your obedience. You go home, read the story. Leave off section. Oh, God, I don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. Can you discern the work of God in you? Do you know him? And can testify of his love, his goodness, and his mercy in you? To anyone who will ask of you the reason for hope, the hope that is in, that is in you with meekness and fear, the word of God says that we must sanctify the Lord Jesus in our heart and that we must be ready to give an answer to anyone who will ask of us the reason for the hope that is in us with meekness and fear. I have dealt with that already, so I will skip down. Why then, if God has done all this, and we have accepted his grace and has received his forgiveness, do we not know him when he desires to know us and wants to reveal himself to us? And this brings us to the second of the, of the three reasons I'm going to discuss today. And one is that we have not yet died to ourselves. We have not yet died to ourselves. There is a veil of self blocking our relationship with God and stifling our spiritual life. What do you mean, Brother Glenroy? Okay. In Luke chapter 14, verse 26 and 27, Jesus Christ said, If any man come to me and hate not his father, okay, we know who father is, his mother, we know who mother is, his wife, we know who wife is. And listen, as this is written, it doesn't mean go and hate your wife. You husbands that are hating your wife, this is no scripture to do it on. You ought not to hate your wife. Man ought to love his wife as he loves himself. This is not what that hate means. Okay? Read it in its context. I don't have time to go there. I have a point, another point to go on to. So if this is what Jesus is saying, and I'm simply quoting. His children and his brethren and his sisters. So he quote the whole family. And you think he finished? You think Jesus finished? No. If you do that, you still can't be my disciple. You still wouldn't know me. I will only reveal myself to my disciples. 
Look at the other one. You know I didn't let you turn to it. And his own life. One of the reasons, saints of God, that we do not know God and do not discern God in our lives is because it's too much of our self alive. Too much of who I am. You talk to anyone in Christendom about any difficulty that they're going through. And it will not be long for, it, for, for, for them to use this phrase to you. That is how I am here. Yeah. That's how I am. That is standing and stands often in the way of us knowing God and discerning God in our lives. We must be ready to be what God wants us to be and to be what God says we should be and not hold on to how we are or how we is, to use better grammar. So because we have not died to self, there is a veil. There is a veil. Well, I wouldn't go further because I don't feel like. I don't go further because I don't know. Well, I'm not going further because I don't. So there is this veil. It is not convenient for me. It is not, but, but, well, it is nice. Well, me a feeling, so, 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 so I ain't going. It is no longer a fall at the feet of Jesus. Prostrate and, prostrate and say, Lord, do in me as you want. Lord, you know, there are sometimes, in my early development as a Christian, when I started to read the word of God, sometimes I close the Bible fast. It didn't have a passage of scripture that I wasn't guilty of. No, no, oh, you know, listen, I don't know. If, it's like, so, listen, when a tired get convinced, I go on in Micah or Amos, one of the minor prophets, thinking God will forget. And there he's showing me who I am. Yeah, I don't know if it ever happened to you. Until one day, I say, Lord, but I guilty of the whole Bible. <laughs> no, you laughing. You laughing. You see, God is going to deal with us. And then I had to realize it. And oh boy. I thank God for the woman he has given me, my wife. Yes. Because I, no, I was said it many times, my wife never did me anything. But all my anger and vexation, and I always find she's doing something wrong. Till one day, Holy Spirit, talking to him, Holy Spirit showed me, he said, why do you get angry with your wife? Um, because of what she said. Uh, did she say something wrong? Yeah, but she didn't bong to say it so. <laughs> <laughs> Until the Lord made me realize, I have given you your wife. I have given you your wife. Sometimes I am guilty as charged. When she talked to me, I put my finger on my lip. Men, yeah, after our men's fellowship pastor, to talk to men. <laughs> You want peace in your house? Put your finger. I'm not supposed to quote Calypso from the from the family. But not a word. <laughs> you guys forget too easily, right? It helps. Look at yourself. Always keep looking at yourself. Let that self die. Let that self die. Let that self die. And in verse 27, say, Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. The cross is a symbol of death in us. It has to, it has to kill the self-life. But because there's so much of self, we, we, I, 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 I not do, I'm, not, I'm not doing that. There are some of us make up our minds, we're not doing it. We are going to fight. You know, Paul, Saul was like that and so uh, uh, Jesus had to tell Saul, it is hard for you to kick against the prick. And I think it is appropriate in this message to say to us, who keep resisting the work of God in our lives and thinking it is in other people, 
God wants to change you. Yes, he has given you his love. He has graced you with that love. You know you have been forgiven. You know that. You know you have been cleansed. Listen, a man. I know that. I know. Listen, if it's one thing I know, is I am forgiven. How am I forgiven? Because somebody loved me, God did, and he forgave me. So shouldn't my life be overflowing? Shouldn't people be living off an overflow of love from my life? Why do you still want to be hateful and anger and bitter and, and mean just because? somebody else did something wrong because they have not yet been sanctified? No. Oh, God was patient with you and I. And now we get kind of sanctified. You know, we, 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 we had to work with that. We want to pick on. But she don't have to. It has some Christian. Eh? Man, I got some Christian. Excuse me. They are just not where you are. Love them. Love him because of what God has done for you. But the self won't die. The opinion, I know I write. Well, okay, but hush. <laughs> you understand? Yeah, you're right, but hush. No, you have somebody has to hear it. You have to pull people aside, even if you cause discord and, 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 and disunity. You know you're right? Pray. But the cause of self, then it's so much, it, it creates a veil. That we cannot see God. In Luke 14, 23, Jesus said, Likewise, whosoever of you that forsaketh not all that he had, he cannot be my disciple. We don't want to give up certain things for God. Jesus Christ said in John 12, 24 and 25, he said, Except a corn of wheat fall to the ground and die it abide it alone. I know he was talking about his death. So students of the Bible don't feel a quote in other context. I know he was feeling, he was talking about his dying first for, uh, uh, to bring many sons to glory. But that analogy is true with us because we won't die to self. We abide alone. No God. We, we can't discern God. We won't die. That's the point I wish to make here. It is required of disciples of Christ that they hate their life in this world. Saints of God. I'm closing now. It is required of us that we hate our life in this world. Hmm? <laughs> you know, who, 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 what, what, what pastor, uh, they say there's a hard saying, who, who could bear it? When they, oh, yeah, Jesus said, when he, whoever eat my flesh and drink my blood, and no part of me. And half of the church went back. All those who were in church, when they read the hard saying, you see, that is the place that self. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit. You can't kill self. Self will live unrepented at the very altar. Self, you can't kill self. It is the surrender of your life in obedience to God that caused the self to die. He will lay the cross on you. Yes, He's going to bring people who are going to show you the remnant of what you have in you. And when they come out your mouth, you say, Lord, I thought I'd give up this word. <laughs> yes. It still have to come out. And now you turn on the people. Does she make me do it? You know, Adam and Eve scenario. So it is required of us that we hate our life, our, our life in this world. A life in this world supposes there's a life in the other. If Jesus talked about you in this life, there is clearly another life. There is clearly another life. Jesus said, in this life, well, which other life is there? Then he knows something. But no, alas, all our focus is this life. That will bring us to the third reason why we do not know God. But before I get to that, this, just let me just bring this one explanation in. Our life in this world includes all the enjoyments of our present state, all the riches, the honor, the pleasure, the long life in, to, to possess them, these we must hate. So, you know, once I, my wife and I were shopping somewhere, and I think it was in Lowe's and the States, and you know, you, you know when you go to the bathroom and you see these bathrooms and these vanity and these, um, they call it, whirlpool, what do you call it? Um, jacuzzi. Jacuzzi. I say, oh, Lord, look at that. How would I like to have that? The Holy Spirit tell me, you wouldn't go to church. <laughs> oh, yes. Too much sometimes, too much comforts. 
hold on, hold on. You see? My life, my life is for Jesus. My life, right? So you see what I have in this life? That is okay. Now I know there are things we yearn for and we need. But God is able to supply it. So I'm not worried about that. I, I, I know that. I stop biting my employees. Listen, if you talk to my employees, I'm supposed to be the best boss they ever invent now. <laughs> that is only recently. <laughs> ah, after God made me realize, but look what I have done. It is not their efforts. So if they fail, why well, you can show them my love in you? Listen, yes, you know, oh, that's who we are. So you see why we come up with all kinds of situations. You see why we will be tested. Yeah. Do so and pay their coming on. Well, I don't know if I could pay. And then somebody come with some, some personal request. Uh, boss, um, um, boss. <laughs> 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 you understand? You are going to be tested. Like, but you know God. Say, our oh Lord. Our oh Lord. We cease from doing evil. We learn to do good. So this brings us to the third reason why we do not know God in conscious experience. Our preoccupation with visible things. Now let me just read this. The world of sense intrudes upon our attention day and night the whole of our lifetime. It is clamorous, it is noisy, it is insistent and self-demonstrating. It does not appeal to our faith. In fact, it opposes it. The world of sense or sensual or natural life here, it is here among us. It is self-evident. It is assaulting our senses. It is demanding that we accept it as real and final. That's the situation we are in. Everything around us is visible, and we, are, we have a fixation with it. Everything is what we see and what we realize. But at the center of Christianity, the central theme is the all-invisible one, the invisible reality that is God. But because the world of sense assaults our, the world of sense assaults our senses, the world of, 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 of sense, just, just the sense, the flesh, assaults us, because it does so much to us. You know, it comes like the adver uh, 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 advertisement. Man, they bombard you with so much. Come on, you have to get this now, but you have to get it in two days. You know? and, and, you have to, and this, this is on sale. And you have to reach in the traffic to get it. It will stay on sale. Or somebody will buy it. I'm not going. But you find, you find yourself pressed and rushed because they advertise it. And you have to buy the ticket by this day. And, and, and there's a pressure. Everything. It's of the sense. It assaults us. It wears us out. It's clamoring. The noise. It's not, we're not hearing God because we're hearing the TV. We're hearing everything. We're hearing everything what people say. We, we, we are fearful. We're hearing the lies of the enemy. No time. It crowds out the still, small voice. God is speaking in us. God is here. We don't know it. God is with us, saints. And we need to know it. That's the purpose of this message. So the world of sense triumph. Because why? The lens of our hearts have been veiled by our self sins. It has been veiled. We, it's so much of what we want and so much of what we would like to get. So it veils God from us. So the world of sense triumphs and we give in to what is natural. And we don't realize why we find no joy in serving God anymore. Much to our detriment it does. And as a, re as a result, the visible becomes the enemy of the invisible. The temporal, the enemy of the eternal. We wonder about God rather than experience a life of God's presence in us. We must ask the Holy Spirit, saints of God, to lay hold on, to help us to lay hold on eternal things, to open our eyes that we may see, and to give us acute spiritual perception. We must ask for it and we will get it. We must ask for it and we will get it. He will give it to us. We must ask for it. So we have looked at the three reasons why. We may not be realizing God in our situation. And even like Jacob, God, we saw God in the ladder. Even though God is speaking because of the clamor, because of the noise, we are not realizing it. Today, God wants us to reconsecrate our hearts again to him. 
We need to come and lay down our lives afresh. We have been carrying our own mantle for too long. And the Lord wants us to take his yoke upon, upon us. For he is meek and lowly. In the words of Israel Hutton's song, the title of the song, I think, is To Worship You I Live. Away! Away! Listen to the song. Away from the noise. Alone with you. If we saints of God can get away. I don't think we sing that song here. I don't think so. If you go home, instead of Googling foolishness on Facebook or on people's business, go and look at Israel Hutton's song. And listen to it. Listen to how he sings it. Listen to the pain in his heart. Away, away, away from the noise. And alone with you. Because nothing else matters. I live. I live to worship you. Our calling, saints of God, is to be worshippers of the Lord. Nothing else matters. You have a problem. Nothing else matters. Cast your care upon him. Away from the noise. Away from the clamor. Away from the maddening crowd. Away and alone with God. So that we will get to know him. And that we will be rooted and grounded in the faith of Jesus Christ. And that we will be able to discern the absolute certainty that God is working in our life. And unlike Jacob, we will know it. Amen? That's a quiet answer. You have heard the word saints of God and even before the choir sings and even while the choir is singing I opened the altar this morning to pray. I opened this altar this morning for those of us who want to re-consecrate our lives. We have been torn. We have been distraught. We have fallen away. We are not where we want to be. We find that it is, doesn't make sense serving God. We have no joy coming to church. You know you are empty. God has sent his word and he wants to restore you. He wants to fill you with his love today. If you would respond as the choir comes, we would pray with you. This is not a time to be ashamed. This is a time that if you're seeking God and if you need to be, uh, to be a bolstered or to be bolstered up in prayer, we are here. Just come, even as the choir sings this song. Hallelujah. Just bow our heads before God. Let the choir and the song minister to your spirit. Bow your head, close your eyes before God. Yes, hallelujah. I bid you.
this is simple. But yet it is profound. You are not begging God. For he wants to reveal himself in you. He wants you to know. Remember he showed up. He showed Jacob. He set up the ladder. And he was standing at the head of the ladder. For Jacob to see in the dream. God wants you to know. But as the word was minister. Our hearts may be veiled. We may not be, have been consistent. Or we have not yet died to ourselves. And our hearts as a result are veiled from, from seeing God in our situation. But God wants you to know him. Have that confidence. So as I pray for you, just lift one hand. as a mark of surrender. Yieldedness to God. God is seeing your heart. It doesn't consist of anything. The word of God says in the book of Amos... That we, could, we should take words and return to God. We take words. We come to him with words. We express to him the words in our heart. He sees it. As long as our hearts are humble and contrite, God respects that. He is no respecter of person. But you standing here this night, or this day, you standing here with a sincere heart, the almighty God, the creator of the universe, the, the, the great I am, is taking note of that. He will, and he is, will look to you. He is looking to you. So be not deceived in our minds that it will be any big thing that you have to do. Or you have to go on a 40 days or 50 days. If you could go on that, go on that. I, am, I can't go. What you have to do is to be sincere in your heart. You have to ask as I would pray that the Holy Spirit help us to shut out the world from our vision. You have to as we pray and ask the Holy Spirit to remove our, our unhealthy preoccupation with the visible. In other words, we want to ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, give me eyes for you only. For as I minister, the world of sense intrudes upon your attention and you pay attention to everything else and forget that God is in this place hand you do it not father you have sent your word on purpose oh lord you have sent your word oh god because you care for us you have sent your word oh god so that we won't be deceived or fall away lord from the plan and the thoughts that you have for us you have called us unto your glory lord you have chosen us to be your own lord we know it lord you have put your spirit in us but our hearts have wandered, O oh Lord, and our minds have strayed from its purpose. And, O oh Lord, we grope to find you. Today, O oh Lord, we are sorry, Lord, for our turning away. We are sorry, O oh Lord, for not yielding ourselves in, for, the, for the fullness of your work in our lives. We repent, O oh God, of every sin, of every iniquity, of every sin of omission or commission. Everything, oh God, that hinders you from revealing yourself. Everything that hinders our heart from seeing you, Lord. We renounce it, oh God. We renounce the things of darkness. We repudiate this self-life, oh Lord. And we say, Lord, come reign in us, Lord. Come reign in our hearts. Lord, you said in the book of Revelation that behold, you stand at the door and knock. Lord, you have knocked on the door of our hearts and we open to you, Lord Jesus. Come into our hearts, O Lord, and make us true worshippers, Lord. Reveal yourself, O God. Let the weight of your glory fall upon us, Lord. Every situation that, that, that is in our lives, Lord, that is not like unto you, we yield it. We throw it at your feet. Lord, we are not able to deal with it, O God. Every care, every burden, every fear, every worry right now, Father, we ask that you would take it. Take that burden away from us and free our hearts, O oh God, in the light of your glory and of your grace. We receive your forgiveness, Lord. We receive your cleansing, Lord. We receive the touch of your spirit upon our hearts. And we commit ourselves, Lord, this day as we reconsecrate our lives again, Lord, that you would open the eyes of our heart, Lord, to see you as we follow you. As we seek after you and we seek after you with all our hearts. 
Oh, holy God, make yourself real unto us as a people, Lord. We desire to know you and to see you, Lord. And we ask, oh God, that we will experience the power, the same power, Lord, that raised Christ from the dead. We will see the, we experience that power in every situation. First of all, oh God, the power to ride over the things that are in us, that are yet, oh God, to be conquered. We desire to see those things conquered. And we cry out, Lord, that we would see your hand, Lord, destroying this work of darkness that is in us, that will hinder us. And we want to see, oh God, your power in our families. We want to see our power in our our children we want to see our power in our relationships lord the way the power of love overcomes the power of evil where in this in spite of oh god of the evil that assail us we can walk in the comfort of your love oh manifest your grace unto us again we pray that our hearts will know you and that we will leave this place knowing lord that truly you are in our lives you are in this situation i pray heavenly father that you would touch every heart here and even, Lord, even as they stand, even, oh God, as they received, oh God, this prayer, I pray, Lord, that they would experience, Lord, a touch of your spirit upon their spirit, that they would know that, yes, I have consecrated my heart to God again. Yes, I have given, I have laid down my life. I have promised God, I have surrendered, that they would know that they have done it of a certain, that this will be a red letter day in their life. They will know this day that I came, Lord, and I called out unto you, and you heard me. And Lord, now we would walk with you. Father, we thank you for your love. And I pray, oh God, your blessing upon their lives. Every situation of need, every situation of difficulty, Lord, we lift it up before you. They do not have to utter it to me, Lord. But in the name of Jesus, we lift every petition of the heart here. You know what your people lack. And you know even what you have provided. Now, O oh God, as you open their eyes, they will see the hand of your provision. And you will strengthen them with the contentment to know, Lord, that that you have done for your tender mercies are over all the works, Lord. You open their hands. You open your hands and you feed every living thing. You open your hands and provide it for every living thing. And we are your people we are your children i pray father that they would know you as you desire us to know you and that we will continue to walk from glory to glory not doubting oh god that you are in our lives and in this place and for it we give you the praise for it we give you the glory for it we give you the thanks and for it oh god we give you and declare the preeminence of your reign in our lives above all things we thank you and we bless your people in the name of jesus we thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you for your love. Is there any of you at the altar here who have not given your life to Jesus Christ? You are not saved. You do not have the Spirit of God in you. And the Word of God says that if any man has not the Spirit of God, he is none of Christ. You would like to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today. You would like to get to know this God that I preached about. You would like to receive the free gift of God. I would like to give you an opportunity to do so now. I would lead you in a prayer that will make that difference in your life. All you need to do is slip up your hand and say, Yes, sir, pray for me. I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and to live for him. May I see you? One, two, three, four, five, six. Is there anyone in the, who would join them in the, in the congregation? Anyone who would join in the congregation? Yes, you can come, please. Anyone who would make that decision as I go into prayer? You would receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today. You would want, you want to know God. You want to give your life to God. You want God to save you and deliver you. It's one prayer away. Jesus Christ said, None that come unto me, those of you who stay will come forward, but I wouldn't know why it's cast out. Anyone in the balcony would like to give your life to Christ today? Anyone today would like to join with the saints, the multitudes around the world who have been born in the kingdom of God? You would like to receive Jesus? Let me see by the raise of your hand. Any in the balcony? Any under the balcony? Okay, if there's no one else, those of you at the altar, let, let us pray. Bow your heads, close your eyes. Just want to admonish you before you pray so that you would have an understanding of what you're doing. Jesus Christ is the gift of God. But if God has given a gift, you have to receive the gift to have it. There is salvation in no one else. None can take you to God. None. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. 
And he promises not only eternal life, but he promises abundant life in this earth, in this life. Jesus wants to exchange your wretchedness, your sin, for his holiness. But all you have to do is open your heart and accept him. The word of God says, for with the heart, man believes unto righteousness, but with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. You are here. You believe in the Lord Jesus Christ by your coming. That's a sign of your faith. And now you are going to confess in prayer that God has raised him from the dead. The word of God says you will be saved. For with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So bow your heads and close your eyes. You're not praying to me. I will lead you in a prayer. Repeat the words that I say. But let it be a prayer from your heart. The Holy Spirit will give your mind the understanding. And at the end of this prayer, the miracle of salvation would be done in your life. Say this prayer after me. Lord, dear Lord Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for coming to save me. I believe with all my heart that you left heaven's glory. You came to earth and died for me. I believe with all my heart that you rose from the dead. I now accept you as my Savior and I confess you as my Lord. Lord Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. Come into my heart. Put your Holy Spirit in me and teach me to live for you. By faith, I receive you into my heart, Lord Jesus. And I thank you for saving me. Amen. That's what it is. On the authority of the Word of God, if you mend that prayer in your heart, God has forgiven you your sins and you are born again in your spirit as a brand new babe. No thunder, no lightning. But I just use the word brand new babe. Babies need to be fed the milk of the word of God. So there are some people standing behind you they will make an appointment with you and the purpose of it is to take you into the scriptures to show you what God says about your salvation so that you will know that what you have received is according to will and purpose of God and they will show you how to keep that which you have received. They will make an appointment with you. I want you to keep that appointment and if you do not have a church that you currently go to we would welcome you to fellowship with us at this place of worship. Holiness Revival Ministries. We thank you and we rejoice with you. In Jesus' name. Have a good night.
You richly, you may be seated. 